All right. Welcome, everybody, to uh, UK Boston's uh, Minicon. Uh, I'm Dustin DiTomaso. This is Andrew Klein. We're from MadPow. Uh, we're an experience design <coughs> agency with offices in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Boston, and Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we're here today to talk to you about um, grid design and grid theory and what? Can you turn up the volume? We can turn up the volume. Give me one sec. How's that back there? Oh, right. Nothing. I broke it. <laughs> I think I'm cutting my mic out. All right. Woo. Now we have feedback. It's my mic. All right, I'll do the best I can. Give me a little signal if uh, something's up. Like that. I'm going to hit down one patch. And then just pray it. Oh, look at that. So it doesn't work over here. Works over here. All right. Right? We OK? Back good? All right, and I'll stay right here. So, uh, so we're here to, to, today to talk about uh, grid design, grid theory, what that does for you as a designer, the efficiencies that it gives you when designing, uh, what that does to the effect, aesthetic effect on usability. Wow, this is going to be great. And sort of how that carries through the entire way down, uh, down the chain from wireframing to testing to uh, visual design to coding to final product. Uh, we'll adjust this a little bit. Um, so, and we'll get on started. I'll, I'll hand this over to Andrew while he adjusts the volume. If I have to just yell and get rid of this, I will. Right, so as Dustin said, we're here to in introduce the concept of using a grid system uh, to increase usability and help inform your design decisions. As interaction designers, we design for functionality and information presentation. Uh, we're defining what information to display and when, designing systems, screens, modules, and controls. The systems we design are created to present and interact with enormous amounts of information, and much of the functionality and information presentation takes place as modules on the screen. So those modules that we arrange uh, on the page, once you start to lay those out, we need to start to consider uh, how those lay out in relationship to each other on a page when composing, 
because the composition, the full out composition of the page has an effect on the overall usability, the usability, the sort of the perceived aesthetics of the product that you're doing from your viewport all the way through to the systems from page to page to page. So as complexity increases with the designs that you're making, you need to sort of really narrow down and focus uh, even more fine-tuned on the choices that you're making, on those relationships between elements, and thinking about things like reading order, uh, functionality, um, spatial differences, sizing of elements, um, all the way down the page. So from a you know, horizontal view all the way down to a vertical view, if you've got scrolling pages or if you've got sort of a fixed view. Um, so what a grid does is that logic that we use as interaction designers from systems to page to modules controls sort of has the same effect uh, of grids. You have a grid system which creates a framework which allows you to create templates which allows you to create modules that you then drop onto those templates. Um, so using grids, when you're working with a grid system from the front, uh, these help your designs and yourself as a designer create clarity, efficiency, economy, and continuity. So what are some examples uh, of systems in place that we, that we can look to to inform our, our decisions? Uh, print publications, for example, present vast amounts of information very content on a regular basis. Uh, they successfully maintain a content hierarchy across multiple sections and pages while maintaining a continuity uh, when presenting disparate content. Uh, just to, to manage the sheer volume of evolving content and ensure consistency over time, they rely on an underlying framework to inform the page composition. Uh, we can apply the same thinking by using a grid system to assist in managing and informing the systems that we create uh, by designing uh, screen compositions uh, within that type of uh, a grid system. So, uh, how does this uh, impact the overall usability of uh, a system or a site or the product that you're developing? So, before anything else, uh, the grid introduces a systematic order. Uh, this order is uh, you know, a pinnacle piece of the layout that you're doing. It helps to distinguish, as I mentioned earlier, between different types of information, and it sort of guides the user through that information, deals with understanding of what that information is, what I'm supposed to do, and the navigation pathways that I'm supposed to take throughout uh, a product or an interface. So when people come into a, a, a site, say, or any sort of um, digital interface, what they're looking for is not necessarily uh, sort of an aesthetic feel of order, but what they notice is um, a sense of disorder. So when things are off, uh, the untrained eye can pick that up and sort of sense like, oh, you know, something's wrong here. What's going on? There's something that's slightly off. So people, like average folks are looking for that, they pick up on that sense of order the same way designers sort of look at uh, order and aesthetics and systems. So when you're using a grid to lay out your, your items on a site, you can again, it goes back to that, those earlier tenets of you know, order, clarity, harmony, uh, information uh, presentation. And when you do sort of really dense and really thick websites, um, those grids really help the user determine where the eye is going to go and what they're going to do. And if you have a module that stays in one place, if those things are shifting from page to page, it becomes sort of uneasy, so it gives you an uneasy feeling of what's going to happen. You can never quite be sure when you click on something what's going to happen on the other side of that interaction, on the other side of that click point when things are shifting over. So using a grid, all the way from the start of your design through implementation helps really pinpoint that focus. Um, and we'll show you sort of uh, some examples of that too. And the other big thing here too is there is a, a principle of uh, perceived usability effect, uh, aesthetic effect, sorry. Um, so what that means is when you have two, uh, two interfaces, two concepts or multiple concepts, when things are more or less the same, the items, the page, the composition, that has sort of a, a more refined um, design aesthetic to it, 
people usually pick that one and say this one is easier to use when comparing side to side to other uh, similar interfaces. Um, you know, we all sort of talk about the theory that you know you leave things rough and you get more feedback, and it sort of really tempts people to you know really be open and honest with you about the feedback and their experience when testing. Um, I've heard it. I, I've you know I've sort of been drilled as a, as a mantra. In my experience, it can be a lot easier to get that sort of feedback when people really understand, you know, what is the content that I'm looking at? What am I supposed to be doing? Grids really help you sort of lay this out, define it, and puts that extra sort of bit of polish onto a design that really helps users understand and grasp uh, the functionality, and it enables sort of behaviors that you want them to go through without that sort of disconnect that, you know, something is off. They can't quite figure it out, but when something's off, it sort of throws the behavior and the entire sort of chain of commands off. So uh, aesthetic design choices affect the understanding of function, and therefore that influences user behavior. So how does working with the grid help the designer? Uh, using a grid permits a designer to lay out enormous amounts of content information in substantially less time because many of the de design considerations have um, previously been addressed and thought through when building the grid structure. Uh, this also holds true when updating or adding new content once the project is live. Uh, the grid also allows many individuals to collaborate on the same project or in a series of related projects over time without compromising the integrity of the visual qualities defined in that initial phase. Having an established grid system allows efficient updating and expansion of large-scale sites and uh, accelerates the approval times by content managers. <coughs> so the grid is a tool for visual organization. Uh, grids create a system of recognizable repeated intervals to which both positive and negative elements can be al aligned. Uh, grids become a system when the underlying framework is used across multiple page templates. So let's go through some of these elements. Um, so we're going to walk you through some of the components that make up the grid, an overarching grid, kind of talk you through what those are. Um, after we all get assimilated there, we'll start to put this to real use and kind of show you how we set up documents and how we start to design uh, using an underlying grid framework. So, uh, columns. Columns divide your page into usually equal measures of vertical divisions. Um, you can sort of just split your canvas into equal groups um, to start out, and those columns, individual columns, can then be grouped together to form larger workable areas for your content. Uh, some other oops, parts of grids are gutters. So if we go back and forth, this is working, yes. So columns specifically are those vertical columns. Uh, your gutters are the spaces in between your columns, which are there. And then you also have margins, which is the space on the outside of your design, which helps to sort of focus the eye inward and lets the, you know, the users sort of focus on that content. It gives you a sort of a divine point straight in. Um, in addition to columns, we have uh, a baseline grid. What a baseline grid is, is it's, it's typically, it has been uh, set up from um, the line spacing in a block of typography, or, or leaden. Um, we use it in a couple different ways. So baseline grid goes all the way under. It's your sort of horizontal lines that take up the entire vertical length of your design. What that does is it gives you uh, distance and space in between items that you're hanging. So you can use it for type. You can also use it to sort of align the top edges of any sort of items or modules that you're laying down onto the design and onto the page. Um, the baseline grid definitely helps create sort of rhythm uh, along a page. And sort of one thing I like to think about, I don't know how, how many people are, are versed in music, but uh, I make a lot of connections to music and design. So when you have a grid, right, for example, really quickly, um, if you have a 16 column grid, so if you think of 4-4 four, four music, if I'm losing anybody, just make me go on. So 4-4 four, four music, 16 notes all the way across. 
those can be considered sort of like sixteenth uh, notes. You group two, you know, you group two of those. Those are now half notes. So you now have this half note measure. You group four of those. You now have a quarter note measure. You group, group eight. You now have, you know, half note. You group the whole thing. You have a whole note. So it's this rhythm. It's this sort of musical time rhythm through the page. So those columns help that left to right rhythm. This baseline grid helps that vertical rhythm. Um, and another thing that's sort of key here is we show you how to set this up. But one of the things too, especially in the wireframing stage, is you don't want to drive yourself crazy, uh, like zoom way in like 500 times to, to line up all the, you know, the boundary boxes and all your type. Uh, not neat, it's probably, you know, the payoff there is probably not worth it. But uh, as a visual reference to, uh, to sort of have this, to use it, to let it guide the spacing in between your items is great. So, oops, this thing's making me nuts. So um, in addition to those lines, so if you imagine underneath, we have all those baselines. In, the, in addition to those, we also have what we call flow lines. So flow lines divide sort of sections of content. So that gives it sort of that breathing room, that sort of vertical space in between sections of a page. So it could literally be uh, a line between, you know, a content item, breathing room, another content item, or it can also, these can be grouped uh, into sections, which can then allow you to create sort of more elaborate, um, busier systems and modules that sort of take up entire grids. So the top half of something could be one section of a site or a page or a UI. The other section can be uh, another element. And you know, depending on your design and the problems that you're solving, this sort of helps you, again, set up that flow, but a hierarchy that uh, has a lot to do with functionality and how a user is going to interact with your system. Um, so the other quick note, uh, don't work with this a lot in visual design uh, and interaction design, but if you do create uh, a full-on grid, so of multiple repeating flow lines along with those gutters, uh, you create what's called a modular grid, which was sort of very big um, in the print world and in the type world. Um, has a little less relevance, uh, relevance to what we do today. Um, and again, back to those groupings. So, when you have this grid set up, and when you have those systems, those mathematical systems of flow lines, you create um, what we call fields and spatial zones. So again, those fields sort of operate as areas to hang logical content. So I mean, you can sort of already kind of think of if this is a marketing or advertising site that you're working on, that top field is very much you know, a hero area. It's the welcoming area. It's the push. It's the messaging system. If you block out the next content, so this could be sort of where you have, um, you, you break that up into other columns and have sort of you know, calls to action in that section. Below that field, you could then have you know, sort of footer information or you know, uh, data that's not quite as relevant. Spatial zones, again, that yellow box. Um, so if we think again back to how we take systems, pages, modules, spatial zones, once you designed and sketched your modules and you figured it out, you can then block out these spatial zones for where your modules are going to fit. And you can kind of figure out, oh, I can fit this many things sort of on a page, um, and this is where they're going to lock up in line. So as Dustin mentioned about uh, the, the musical theory in, in terms of helping you lay out a, a, a column grid or even laying out elements within your defined grid, uh, there's other proportional systems that we can take advantage of. Uh, they help guide your compositional decisions, um, like I said, either placing elements on the page or with, with it designing within those same elements that you just placed. They can help create tension, energy, and areas of interest. Uh, the rule of thirds is a simplified mathematical approach that divides any format into thirds. The intersection of, of these axes create points of focus. And the overall proportional unity allows a designer to lay out elements within that composition. Uh, so for example, you might want to consider placing a button or a call to action at one of those uh, areas of tension across those axes. Uh, mathematic precision is a key element of good, good grid design, and math can be used to create uniform or 
irregular units and columns to frame your designs. The simpler the system is to calculate or explain to others, uh, the more beneficial it will be down the line. Uh, for example, here we're showing dividing uh, the space within a set amount of columns in a different proportion. Uh, so you don't have to feel locked into using you know, maybe three elements across in those, uh, in the, in those columns. So you can divide that space further, place other, other items within. You might uh, take advantage of this in uh, e-commerce e format or something, where you might want to display multiple items kind of as individual units. And the golden section. Uh, this is dividing any given width uh, using the ratio of 1.618. Uh, it's also called the divine proportion. It creates a natural proportion uh, that is perceived as beautiful when, when seen in nature. Uh, I use this quite often then uh, to divide a space and place elements either along the lines that of, of the division or placing elements in that proportion on the page. Some guiding principles to, to consider. Uh, grid should focus on problem solving first and aesthetics second. Uh, it can be tempting to, to force designs to conform to a predetermined grid or squeeze and, and stretch items uh, within, but what we want to do is start with the elements that are relevant to our project first and define the grid around those. And then second, the simpler the grid, the more effective. Alright, so there's a quick super overview of theory behind it. We're going to talk about kind of how we put those uh, items to use uh, in everyday work over at MadPal. Um, so what we definitely want to advocate for, um, and I hope everyone's doing that, is uh, sketching first. So taking pen to paper or marker to whiteboard, hopefully not uh, permanent marker to whiteboard, but um, to sketch first. So you under, you've gotten your requirements, you've done your research, you know what it is that you're going to be designing. First things you should do is start to think of, well, what are those elements? What are the things I know need to go here? Uh, and I'll back that up a bit too. If you are thinking about the overall picture, the overall system that you're designing for, one of the things I like to do is start with what I think is the most complicated page, right? So, I, or, or, or view, uh, if it's sort of an interactive product rather than a, a website. So what that does is it, it enables me to spend a lot of time up front and think about, you know, what are these worst case scenarios? What's the most complicated thing I'm going to design? And then I can back off, when I create a system for that, I can then back off that system and simplify it for pages that are a lot easier. Uh, it can be tempting, especially on the UX side. I think visual design may be something a little different. They want to go for brand color, so they want to have the impact of brand. But when you're thinking of you know, the interaction design or the, you know, the, the user experience, start with the hardest problem um, instead of going to the home page. A home page can be sort of its own problem, and it may not have a lot to do with the other pages within the system. Plus, you don't want to back yourself into a corner by working on a simple, simple page by the time you go deeper, uh, now you're kind of stuck and you have to go back and rearrange the front page. Also part of the process, um, but you know the idea is you start with the most complex, um, what I like to do. So messy sketches, I'm not a great sketcher. Um, but uh, don't worry about scale, don't worry about proportion. The idea is you want to generate ideas and options. Multiple options, multiple ideas of the same problem. So one screen different ways to work out one screen. Then you start to think about, well, what's the likely transition that a user is going to take from this screen or this view to the next screen? Start to work on that. So you kind of put out a, a flow. I like to do like many, many sketches of maybe three or four key screens. It's probably a flow, you know, coming from that most complicated use case and uh, where are they coming from, where are they going to. I kind of map that out. Uh, Lots of iterations. So the key here is, you know, as you're drawing, as you iterate, you then evaluate the sketch that you have, and you resolve that sketch. So what that means is many, many sketches. Think about what you've done. Uh, 
sort of make those decisions, those design decisions that, yeah, this is the right way to go, this is not the right way to go. Take that right one and then fine tune it. So again, still on paper. So I've gotten a little bigger. Um, I'm starting to fine tune things because the problem is being solved in my head. <coughs> Excuse me. So I can get a little bit more detail as I sketch out. And again, I'm still doing more options of, at this level, at, at this level of fidelity, a little bit larger. So more options, different views of, of the same page, how that would go. So we'll assume I have that. <coughs> Sorry. So as you're, as you're placing elements on the page, uh, you're going to begin to see a loose page structure start to emerge. And you might be surprised at how many visual design decisions you're making in placing these elements. Um, and you're actually applying some of the proportional systems that we uh, just reviewed inherently. Um, so once you have your initial composition resolved, uh, we extend that to that sketching to additional pages or states, um, and then go through that process of iteration, evaluating and resolving and refining until those key pages work together. Um, at this point, we want to look for any recognizable or repeated intervals that we could uh, tr transfer then to that underlying framework that we're going to want to use to formalize the design. Can we go back? To <coughs> wow, sorry. Uh, let's just go back for one quick second. Um, so as you can kind of see, as these sketches sort of start to evolve and get a little more fine-tuned, you can kind of see where that underlying grid, kind it sort of makes itself known. It's the way I kind of think of it. So it's sort of like a statue makes itself known from a block of marble. The grid kind of makes itself known from this, the sketches that you're making. You can kind of see there's columns, there's a system that's maybe you know, three units wide, where this is one unit wide. The next one sort of goes like a, a, a one unit, four unit, one unit. You can kind of see it sort of takes place naturally. It's not really a conscious part that you're intentionally blocking things out as you sketch, but it, you let it sort of rise and come about naturally. So then we're going to talk about, we have our sketches. We've, we've got them. We've, we're convinced this is the solution. Now it's time to digitize. So we're going to put this into uh, a software program. We like to use Fireworks at, at MadFile. Um, there are other tools. One of the things I do like to suggest is to use sort of a pixel-based software, so something um, that allows you to be accurate with pixels. Um, and I know, again, in, in UX community, a lot of people like to use sort of like Visio and OmniGrapple and Axure and stuff like that. Great for prototyping. Um, also great for sketching. But our process is, you know, sketch on paper first. I think if you've sketched it out on paper, you don't, you then should be able to take it up the next level to something that is pixel accurate, um, as opposed to sketching on paper and then putting it to something that doesn't exactly relate to true sizes and dimensions that you know the product is going to be once it's on screen. So we're going to um, talk really quickly about uh, some tools you can use. Uh, if anyone uses grids, there's a, there's a site and a, a kit that you can download called uh, 960 Grid Systems. Anyone use that? Familiar with it? A smattering of folks? OK, cool. Um, it's a great place to start. Uh, if you go to 960.gs, you can download these um, templates. They're in probably a dozen or so uh, formats. So whatever software is the one that you uh, are, are most comfortable with, there's probably a template for that. Uh, however, there's some problems with those templates, and we're going to show you a couple of quick fixes. So if you, uh, if you start now, if you use a 12-column grid, 12-column grid is a great place to start. You can go to 16. It comes with a 12 and a 16. You can start to make your own grids uh, and columns as you get more comfortable. But 12 is a great place to start. Uh, and 12 is good because it's flexible. It, it offers you, you know, divisions of 2, 3, 4, uh, which are very useful in common divisions. Um, so what we want to do is uh, when you open that 960 uh, grid template, uh, you'll notice that it's um, it's 1024 by 1024 or 1040 or something. Which what happens there is that the the baseline grid or the document grid actually gets off 
from the grid that uh, is inherent in the template. So the first thing you want to do is, so this is assuming you're doing like a, you know, for 10, 10, uh, 1028 resolution. So um, you want to crop this to 1020 to make it uh, an even divisible by 10 number. Uh, the height, you can sort of uh, adjust later when you kind of know, like, or from your sketches, if you know this is a long page, you can adjust the, the height. If it's a fixed width, like a 600, you're going to cap it somewhere, then you can adjust it here. Um, otherwise, the key here is to crop it to 1020, so if you're taking uh, two pixels off each side. Then what you're going to do is set up your um, baseline again. <coughs> And the default here is 36 by 36, which uh, is kind of unusable. So what you want to do is change the, the distance of your document grid from 36 to 10 wide. And then we use 18 vertical, so it gives you this system of rectangles. Why we do that is, um, again, that creates your baseline <coughs> grid and your distance between type. Uh, type online. Uh, very typically is in like the 11 point to 14 point range for body as a default. Uh, so 12 is a really good, you know, sort of safe measure. Uh, and that 18 point distance allows you to sort of double space and get some good line letting in between your body, you know, in between your text so that the text will breathe and will be easier to, to read. And then typically as you're flowing text across columns, you can hit that sweet spot of, you know, like 70 characters across for good reading. Um, so uh, the other thing, again, with this is we start to set up that type hierarchy. I figure out what is, you know, what's my H1 size, what's my H2 size, um, what's the body size, and do that with sort of Greek text. Don't really worry at the wireframing stage about, you know, what fonts, as long as it's sort of a web safe font. Uh, sort of visual design, take care of you know, putting the, the finesse and, and final touches on that. And um, when working with type and setting up that hierarchy, I have a simple thing to use or take advantage of is your t the type palette and scale that's uh, baked into most likely the software that you use. So if you just go into the type palette, it will give you a, a natural scale portion to apply to uh, your layout. Uh, so at this point, we have our framework set and we're, and we're ready to begin our page composition. Uh, we'll go through a similar process as our sketching, iterating, um, evaluating the items we place, and then resolving those. Uh, so we have the framework, but it doesn't do the laying out for us. It informs our decisions. Uh, so what we like to do is start with uh, a single, single modular uh, or module on the grid and evaluate how the scale proportion works uh, based on what you had envisioned in your sketch. How does that translate to, to the actual page? Uh, here we're starting with the navigation bar as kind of a nice anchor element to begin with. And then what, what we do is uh, continue to add elements, pulling styles from uh, previous elements that we've placed and, and resolved, bringing those into the new elements that we're putting down on the page. And if there's something new in that in that new element or a new styling that we're applying, we take it into the elements that we've already placed on the page. So it's just kind of this revolving cyclical layout. Um, and as we're dropping things onto the page, we're snapping to the guidelines that we've put in place, aligning the text to the baseline, um, aligning the, any blocks of content to the columns, and, and allowing the margins to inform our spacing. Um, we also may want to uh, look at the, at this point, is everything holding up correctly? Is the reading order or the page hierarchy panning out? Um, does that uh, title bar have enough prominence? Uh, is, it, is it too prominent? Uh, we'll, so we'll look at the scale and proportion of the items as individually, uh, but then also in the composition as a whole and make adjustments. Uh, what the grid can also help us do is uh, it, uh, it allows us to, um, to account for some negative or white space. Uh, we don't need to fill every block of the, of the screen. Uh, so it, having a grid kind of it gives us uh, some natural spacing uh, that we can take advantage of. Um, another item that we could consider is uh, 
asymmetry in the layout. So not having everything line up exactly and, uh, <coughs> symmetrically adds interest to the page. Uh, there's also elements that we may want to display across multiple pages consistently. So here's where we would drop uh, one of the flow lines or, or a guideline on the horizontal axis so that we can extend that into other additional pages. Uh, but we also want to evaluate the page composition as a whole and once we've placed everything on the page. <coughs> and once it's feeling well resolved, we can begin to extend the grid uh, foundation to additional page templates and that begins to establish our system. So we're going to uh, define our page types, fill in uh, on, within the grid that we've defined for those additional page types and then that informs our templates that will extend throughout all the other screens we'll be working on. So as we uh, apply the grid to the additional page designs, determine what works, uh, what needs to change for this page. So as we then look at all the pages that we've created, uh, we do the same thing that we did at the micro level, at the macro level, doing it to the entire page composition. Does, it, does the grid still hold up? Do we need to tweak things? Um, are, there, is, are our screens looking stagnant? Is, is there a new way that we could use the grid to um, either push or uh, uh, replace or reposition items to add a little bit more interest. Um, and it's also never too late to go back to sketching. So if we're, uh, something didn't pan out quite like we had planned, uh, we can go back and, and do a new, new sketch for that page and then bring it, bring it in. Uh, so our page designs and the coinciding grid structure should now create that system of, of recognizable repeated in intervals that we set out to create. And then this is that same uh, wireframe structure extended into the visual design uh, for the final layout. And you'll see that the visual design team uh, continued to resolve and refine that grid using it in new ways. Uh, so either breaking out of the box entirely or removing the box uh, from the layout but that same structure is still in place and, and forms all of the uh, visual design layouts uh, moving forward as well. Uh, so that's why we think we feel it's uh, important at the wireframing phase to uh, relate to pixels and, and uh, that's why we use fireworks as it extends over into visual design and the final product, um, it, it just is produced at a higher level. So uh, to wrap up and sort of recap, um, I think this kind of sums it up rather nicely in a, in a very long, um, fancy paragraph. Uh, so uh, use a grid system to increase usability by creating more aesthetic compositions through crafting well-considered framework on which to build a system of screen templates. So yeah, it's a mouthful, but um, really, uh, if you start, if you start to make this part of your design process, um, once you get kind of comfortable with it, it, it really becomes second nature. Uh, and you know, there are also questions about: is it limiting? Does it, you know, is it going to influence me? Is this grid going to tell me what to do? And no, you're the boss of the grid. The grid is not the boss of you. Um, so <laughs> it becomes nature. You start to think about it. Once you know those rules, then you can begin to kind of break those rules. Uh, again, with, with any sort of skill or craft that you do, again, music, uh, sports, art, whatever it is, once you sort of know how to utilize it, once you own it, you can then start to break it and it becomes second nature. Um, so that's kind of it for us. Um, I would say go to 960 Grid System and uh, check it out and uh, you know, good luck with it. If you have questions, let us know. I know you have questions now. so. I saw a hand up in the back, uh, blue shirt. Would you be able to share these slides online? Before? Yes, sorry. Uh, we will definitely put these slides up on SlideShare. We'll probably put them up on madpow.com as well um, within the next week for sure. Great, thank you. Um, other blue shirt in the back. Can you elaborate a little bit on when to break out of grids? Sure. Andrew, do you want to take it? Sure. Uh, well, like I 
had said when we when we start to lay out our composition, um, the, the grid informs our, our decisions, but it, it so it allows you to see that structure. You can just experiment, play with it. Um, once you have an element down, you might want to stretch it across a border uh, of, a, of a grid or a cup, uh, a, a crossing margin, I should say. But it comes down to just do, to doing that iterative process and, and seeing what works. It's just kind of experimenting. Yeah, there's, there's two other things I'd add to that, too. Is one, if you want to call attention to something, great point. break that out of the grid. Break the axis, move it over. When you have other things that are lined up, the thing that is now not lined up it creates attention. It, it sort of stands out. And also, if you have two slavish um, adherence to a grid, you get this checkerboard pattern, and you may have seen sites. There's sites that are like, we love the grid, and all the designs are like these checkerboards, and that's like, awful too. So that's not what you want. Um, so it's sort of, you know, more function to make something stand out, or when things are too samey, start to break that grid and create interest, because interest is very important. Um, way in the back, I'm going to know them up front. So um, I know that Matt Powell has very strong design and usability and capability in the house. Um, and just in perusing the web, some of the worst sites are like art houses, um, like museums. As far as their usability, they look great. They're using a lot of um, the techniques that you obviously have. Yeah, so the, there's, there's two phases to that. One is uh, we do you know, like to do a lot of you know, research up front. We do testing, whether it's with uh, users, stakeholders, internal reviews. We sort of flesh things out many times before, you know, and again, it's that iterative cycle. Many cycles of testing with different people classes. Um, so we have that up front. The design is, you know, we're being very mindful of what are the interactions, what is the intended action, what is the user likely to do, what does that user want to do. So knowing what those goals are, what the purpose of the site is, and focusing that. So you take that, that's the big important thing, is what is this thing I'm building, who's using it, what's it for, what do they want to do, what do we want them to do, and now, how does that fit into a beautiful type grid system that can carry out across all pages or all states of an interaction design. And then at the end, when we have some sort of level of product, we can then do actual usability testing, whether it's through uh, static click-throughs, HTML templates, the live site, or whatever. So we definitely ensure it. if something's off, if we're wrong, we then go back and fix it and bring it through that cycle again. I would add that it's, it's great to have UX and visual design on the same team. So there's a lot of communication back and forth. So as visual design is making those decisions that might break out of a grid or, or try something completely different or a, like a fresh approach, we always talk to the UX side to you know, find it out if those decisions are appropriate or if we're going too far. <coughs> Any uh, uh, considerations when using uh, the grid with uh, like a liquid design or liquid experience? Sure, yeah, so, so right, so liquid is, liquid is hard because you're going to start to lose those, those you know, the, the padding in between elements and the margins. There's a, there's a few things, so we started to talk about how this might play out into the top. Liquid is hard. I think the idea is to still keep those grid systems, see how that scales. You need to make intelligent decisions of what is going to flow. You know, if your text is flowing, you know, there's also, there's a limit. But the complication, as well as the beauty of, of the web and online products, is you do lose that control. Once it's out in the wild and the users have it, you don't know, you know, what there's, a lot of times, what their screen preferences are, if they're going to, like, you know, grow text, shrink the window size, stretch things out. So, fluid is hard. I mean, I think that's why the rise of that fixed width, you know, pages and elements are so popular. It becomes the designer kind of imposing or enforcing, you know, his decisions, um, which is okay. Uh, one of the things I really like uh, right now is sort of responsive design. 
Uh, so for when you're taking a, a website um, and transferring that to mobile, there's two ways to go. There's like, do you do a mobile specific site, which is you know, sort of pairing of the content, make a limited functionality <coughs> thing that's perfectly sized for small screens, or do you, you know, there's a coding method called responsive design, which can take those blocks and containers and it reconfigures as the screen size changes, so it sniffs it, which sort of takes the idea of grids and puts it on like a three-dimensional axis. So if you know I have three blocks of content here on a 960 screen, and I'm going to mobile, I want to say these three things now fall in a vertical line. So it becomes like that extra level of design to think about of how all my systems and modules are going to tie together on any kind of screen. So kind of cool, kind of excited. So it's there. There's considerations, but you know, solid grid sort of helps define what's going to move. Anyone else? I'll go in the front here too again. Um, could you comment on the grid in Wired magazine? Wired gives me a headache. Is it off the grid? But are there grid people and non-grid people that you really have to uh, take into account? What do you mean by grid people and non-grid people? People, people <laughs> who respond positively to a grid-based practical design and people who find that very off-putting who are more drawn to the, 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 the graphical design philosophy of wire Man, I, I can't say I can, I mean, I've been to Wired, of course. Uh, I can't get a clear view of how they've organized that site. I feel like there is a, a grid to that were you, site. Were you referring to the, the print publication? Or I, was referring to, I was referring to the, to the print. Yep. But um, I guess, but I assume the Wired is, the, 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 the uh, web is kind of like the prints. Uh, I would think that they have some kind of, some type of underlying grid system that they do apply to, the, to that magazine. Uh, how they break out of that, and it, it's all scale and proportion too. So grids are—they're not. You might—you might be thinking that it, the grid cons constricts the design, and they may have the philosophy of it allows them to to make these crazy layouts that that, that stretch or push boundaries of scale and proportion and that type of arrangement. Okay, take a look at that. So thanks. I guess that's it. That's time. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.